My name is Jim McGilvery and welcome to The Pipe Box, your source for all things piping. If you find this video useful, please give it a like and please subscribe to this YouTube channel to see more videos like this. We're going to be looking at some music today and you can print out this music by going back to the YouTube channel to the description of this video on the YouTube channel and in there you will see a link to a PDF for the music today. Today I would like to do another tune with you. I'd like to do one of our great competition reels, Alex C. McGregor. Alex C. McGregor was written by G.S. McLennan. G.S. McLennan is considered one of our greatest pipers ever. Some consider him our greatest piper ever by virtue of his playing, his competitive record, and his compositions. You can see a bio of G.S. McLennan on my Pipe Tunes website. Alex C. McGregor was a competitor around the end of the 1800s. He was a little bit older than G.S. We have a photo of him in 1894 at the Northern Meeting in Inverness with the rest of the competing pipers. We don't know exactly what the connection was between G.S. McLennan and Alex C. McGregor that warranted G.S. writing such a great tune and dedicating it to Alex C. McGregor. Here is a scan of the original manuscript of G.S.'s tune sent to me courtesy of the McLennan family in Aberdeen. As you can see, there is a date at the top. This may refer to the date of composition. G.S.'s manuscripts are written with minimal technique and minimal pointing, particularly in the reels and the marches. He didn't write all the technique in his manuscript. He wrote the tunes out in the manuscript book basically for him to remember. And many of the tunes were numbered because he didn't have a title for them yet. Uh, many of G.S.'s tunes were titled years later by his brother, half-brother, D.R. McLennan. Alex E. McGregor first appears in G.S.'s first and only book, which was published in 1929 when G.S. was 45 years old and on his deathbed. Here's a scan of the tune taken from the book. As you can see, the lack of pointing continues. This was how G.S. published reels, and marches, allowing the expression to be managed by the performer rather than the composer. Some of the technique here, as you can see, say, at the end of bar one, where a GDE is written out as a doubling, is a little bit different from the way we write out technique today. I'm going to teach the expression of this tune in what we call an open style. Let me explain that. In years gone by, and still today, uh, many players play their reels in a fairly pointed style. Quite clipped, actually. In the last 50 years, the Irish tradition of playing round reels has changed the way Highland Pipers play reels. Round, two-parted reels are the norm now. Competition tunes haven't gone to that length of roundness, but they are rounding out into a sort of a hybrid, semi-pointed, semi-rounded tune with longer short notes and the grace noting more distinct and separated. So you will hear me talking about making short notes very distinct as we go, as we try to make the tune a little rounder than it might have been played 50 years ago. I want to demonstrate this roundness using the GDE grace note pattern that is ubiquitous in real playing. Here is a brief little GDE exercise in real time to show you what I mean. Fuck. 
in bygone days, you might have heard this exercise played something like this. Quite clipped, much more clipped than most real players are playing it today. Today, players don't hold the long note after the G grace note quite so long, and perhaps more importantly, they make sure that there is a space between the D grace note and the E grace note. So instead of we have Let's listen to the exercise again that I just played, and I want you to hear that little space between the D and the E grace notes. By the way, if you have trouble with this exercise, particularly playing D grace notes on short C's, then it's possible that Alex C. McGregor may not be the right tune for you right now, or at the very least, you may need to work on some technique before you tackle it at tempo. So let's go through the tune. I'm going to play each part for you, and then we'll talk about each part, and then at the end, I will play the whole tune. So let's listen to the first part. Bar 1. Last half of bar 1 and the last half of bar 2 are GDE. We talked about those. We know how to play them. I won't talk about them too much more. The first half of bar 1. Hee hee da da dee, hump a dum, hee hee ha da da, we have a long E and then we have a short C and a short B. Your tendency in this little group of notes will probably to be to play a very, very short B. <laughs> play a very well enunciated B. It's on the offbeat and it needs to be heard like the rest of the short notes in a reel. Same in bar two, that little run from E down to low A. So the first two bars. I hope you're starting to pick up the, the open style a little bit that is quite far removed from the pointed style that, that people have played in the past and, and still play. Bar three is the same as bar one. Bar four, the first four notes of bar four, again, you're not going to clip the short notes too much. Nice audible short notes. Bar five is the same as bar one. Bar six, this is the same as bar two. In the ending, we have some short notes in the ending that we have to treat very carefully. Let's look at bar seven. That F with the G grace on it is on the beat. It's a short note on the beat and we have to be very careful that we don't play it early. I often hear this. Hold back, play the short F on the beat. and the short C in bar eight on the beat. So bar seven and eight, the ending. Okay, nice, well enunciated short notes all the way through. That is the first part. Let's look at the second part.
the most important thing I would say about the second part is that in the first six bars of the second part, each bar begins with a quarter note. Hold those quarter notes out for their allotted length. Don't pop off them down to the next note. All the way through this part, as we discussed earlier, you're going to see short notes that you're not going to overcut. There's not much more to say about the second part, except one thing I would like to point out about the way G.S. McLennan Grace noted this part. You're going to notice pretty quickly that there, even though the first phrase and the second phrase are almost exactly the same, there's different grace noting. G.S. minimally grace noted bar 9 and 10, and then he added some more grace noting in bar 11 and 12, and then he takes it away again in bar 13 and 14. Very few composers treat technique with such meticulous care, and I have great respect for G.S. McLennan to realize how texturing the tune this way with grace noting removed and added could give the tune so much more richness. So that's the second part. Let's hear the third part. Your ability to play the third part well is going to be very dependent on how well you play GDEs in real time. Adjacent to the GDEs, let's look at bar 17. We see three low A's followed by a short C with a D grace note on it. At the end of the bar, we have another short C with a D grace note on it. These are notes that you may be inclined to crush. Make sure those two short C's are open and well enunciated. <laughs> Don't do this. In bar 18, we have some short notes that need to be distinctly played on the beat or the offbeat. If we look at the last four notes in bar 18, we see a short C going to an E and we see a short C going to a high A. You're going to really enunciate those notes, really punch them out. Watch you don't play them ahead of the beat. Like that. Again, we're talking about so often short notes being played so that they are, are audible and not cut out of existence. In the ending for the third part, bars 23 and 24, again, we have some short notes that simply need to be given some length and put on the offbeat or the beat where they're expected to be. Again, I hope you can hear how audible the short notes are in that ending. That's the third part. Let's go to the fourth. There's only one bar in the fourth part that we haven't discussed as we've gone through this tune. If we look at bar 25, we see a long E followed by a short C and a strike. In the next group of four, we see a long F followed by a short D and a strike. In both cases, we want to make sure that the note before the strike is audible. Strictly speaking, the expression that we play in this pattern, he d ha da, he ha da, is the same as we play in a GDE. Dum ba dum, di da da, dum ba dum, he dum ba do, he dum ba da. Don't crush the note before the strike. 
and play that bar consistently wherever it appears in the part. It appears three times. That's the fourth part. We've been over the whole tune now. Let's hear the whole tune played on a Dagger electronic chanter. played at 84 beats per minute, which is considered the optimum tempo for competition reels. Having said that, I'm a great believer that you do not play above your technical capabilities. So if you're just learning this tune or trying to improve it, play it as slowly as you need to in order to play it technically well. From there, you can move the tempo up until you arrive at a tempo that you're comfortable with. Another great tool to use in all your playing, as I've mentioned in more than one of these videos, is the metronome. I'm a great fan of singing tunes to the metronome. It really brings home the rhythm of the tune, and I find after I've sung a tune to the metronome several times, when I get my pipes out to play them the next day, I'm playing that tune better. I like for reels to take the metronome setting and double it. So if I'm playing a reel at say 80 beats per minute and I double that to 160 beats per minute, now I'm hearing the rhythm in double time and I will sing to this. Really valuable tool for instilling tempo and instilling rhythm into your playing, and that's what you need more than anything in the dance tunes like strespays and reels is rhythm. So that's our tour through Alex C. McGregor, G.S. McLennan's Great Reel. From me, Jim McGilvery, at the Pipe Box, goodbye.